afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in here for our ed panel dis discussion and for spending your Saturday uh, with us here at ATW. My name is Staff Sergeant Katie Thigpen. I am a trombonist here uh, for Pershing Zone. I play in the ceremonial band, and I'm going to be moderating today. So I am very excited about the panel we have and what we're going to talk about today. Um, you probably have heard uh, three of their choirs playing this afternoon, beautiful trombone playing. So we have, uh, I know they need no introduction really, but we have Mark Kellogg, Larry Zalkin, Brad Kearns, and Michael Berner, who also works with me here um, in the Army Band. And they all have a variety of experiences. You have your, uh, the bios in front of you, they have a variety of experience in education, all different levels of education, um, you know, over years and years in different cities and different places with various backgrounds. So uh, we're excited to have them as resources for us today. So our topic this year is overcoming challenges in teaching. And aren't there challenges in teaching? Um, it's likely, as a musician in almost anything you do, you're going to be teaching in some capacity, right? Whether you perform for a living, you might teach private students. Um, even if you play just for fun, you might still be teaching students um, or even family members or something like that. And then, of course, many of us pursue education. I majored in music education. I love teaching. Um, and so, you know, either the collegiate level teaching, maybe you're teaching elementary music. So there's just a wide variety, and it's very likely in this career that you will find yourself doing it in some capacity. So. Uh, let's just get started. I don't want to talk too much. I want them to. I want them to talk. So, I thought I would get started just by you know, usually when we we go to school, uh, we want to become teachers, and you have this expectation, right? You get a job, you're really excited, or maybe you get your first students uh, when you're in high school. You're going to teach the middle school kids. You have all these expectations, and then sometimes. You know, reality doesn't always match those expectations. So I thought I would just start by kind of talking about that and leave it open to whoever wants to chime in with what expectations kind of almost at any point in your career did you have that you then kind of realized weren't exactly, you know, what you got yourself into? Whoever wants to, whoever wants to run with it. I know that's a big question. Yeah. I'll, I'll maybe just throw out the first first pitch, but thank you for, for having us um, so much, Katie, and for all the work that you've done and your colleagues have done to organize things. I think for, for me, one of the biggest challenges uh, that I wasn't expecting was that sometimes on a faculty, not everyone wants to be inclusive and not everyone wants to be a good communicator. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect at either of those aspects of things. So being patient uh, with that and realizing that there are, only, um, there are only so many things that you can do to try and make that situation better um, is, you know, I think it is very important. So I think being patient and wanting to be always part of the solution and not part of the problem. Um, and that, that may be, that may be for a, a number of reasons that you know, obviously it may be, be because someone maybe isn't, you know, maybe isn't into their job, maybe they're not recruiting students, maybe they're not, you know, whatever, maybe they, they feel that there's, you know, something that's happened for them that, that hasn't been, uh, justified and, and they're kind of angry about that. And so you can bear the brunt of that sometimes. But I, I think the most important thing is to try and be patient and, you know, as uplifting as you can, you you know, to the people, you know, around you, even though you do face, you know, those, ad adver those kind of, at times, adverse situations. And these are first world problems when I say adverse situations, right? So, but, um, but I know that's, that's maybe one thing, you know, sometimes coming up just upon colleagues who maybe don't want to be very inclusive or collegial or communicative, you know, about things. I was, mm. I was in the orchestra world most of my life. And when I moved to teaching, I thought it would be a very smooth transition. I thought, you know, there's not that much difference. But from an organizational standpoint, there's so much difference. And I was kind of always underwater because it's going to sound crazy, but 
you play concert, you go home at night, you have a glass of wine, you sit on the deck, you go to bed, the concert's done, whatever's happened, it's behind you, you go on to the next day. A job like Eastman, you go home, there's a thousand things on your mind. I literally, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, like, put everything in perspective. And the way I solved the problem is I started to write everything down. I'd write everything down, I'd have a list, and then if I wanted to relax, I didn't have to worry about remembering all the things that I needed to remember. There are a lot of little things like that that really just blindsided me in terms of teaching that I had to learn to deal with. So that's one of the major issues I faced. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? Well, I don't teach at Eastman. So <laughs> the work that I did before joining the Army Band is I worked with a lot of middle and high school programs. And to me, when I first started teaching when I was in high school, I thought it would be as easy as it was for my formative years, which was, hey, the middle school teacher is my private teacher. Do you have any students that really need help that I can help you with? Then when I moved on and went to my undergraduate and then my graduate degrees, I expected it to be that easy to just, hey, I'm here, I play well enough. And it's not that way. So to build off of building relationships, it can also be that in your community. Going to band directors, going to middle school directors, or even if you are that, knowing your colleagues well enough, knowing the people in your community well enough to be able to go to them, to talk to them, to build a relationship. No one's just gonna give you opportunities. You really have to go and make that connection. Once you have a connection, it's important to keep a positive connection as much as possible. Young me did not always keep positive connections. It would be, this is my student, and I would be very territorial about my private trombone and euphonium students, but the band director is dealing with them every day. I'm only dealing with them once a week. So it's important to be on the same page, to connect with these individuals, to make sure that you're always working together. So that's something that, especially when I was young, I had a very steep learning curve being involved with. Yeah, I think that's something is, you know, I, when I was doing my uh, graduate work, I taught to you, and I think when you're, you know, that age, you think, oh, yeah, my students. But you really have to make sure you keep an open mind and just try to keep all the channels open and as positive as you can. Because you, you know, you've all heard the saying, you don't want to burn any bridges. But you really don't. And, you know, there's no need for that. So you can usually find some kind of solution to at least keep that relationship positive. Um, kind of stemming off of that, you know, as teachers, <laughs> Another thing sometimes, especially when you're young, you think, oh, I'm going to go teach. I want to you know, teach at a university or teach trombone, and that's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach trombone. And then you might get to your first job and go, oh, my word, I'm going to do a lot more than just teach trombone. I have to wear this hat, and then I have to go to this meeting and wear this hat and do this and that, and then you want me to conduct? Um, and so just kind of, kind of um, dealing with all the different hats you have to wear and maybe the variety of things that people might not know about and just, I don't want to say compartmentalize, but how to sort of keep it organized and not let it drive you a little bit crazy <laughs> or be overwhelming. Wow, that's, that's a good one. Um, I think just maybe thinking a little bit about the different hats I wore early on in my career. Um, got out of school and thought, you know, I want to teach in higher ed and and that started out with a couple adjunct positions and then a, a, a job teaching in the Catholic school sort of came available. And um, it was a lot of fifth grade band. It was middle school band at three Catholic schools and high school band. At Catholic, it was a lot of driving. Um, actually, I, I loved it. I loved it. Uh, fifth grade band is to this day is one of my favorite things I think I've taught. Um, <laughs> That being said, I think it's it's easy to um, possibly think, well, I'll do this until I do this thing that I've dreamed of doing. Um, spinning wheels, you know, think, ah, oh, I'm doing this middle school band job. I'm not crazy about it. I want to be a college professor. But I I loved it, and I actually it was it was funny because when I interviewed for my first full time college position. They asked me so many questions about my middle school band job, and I had no idea that would pop up. I thought they're going to ask me about my teaching, you know, higher education, the, my experience there. But they were like, 
you know, when I was at this Catholic school, I showed up and there were six people at my first Christmas concert. It was four saxophones, a trumpet, and a drummer. <laughs> and it was pretty wild. So I thought, well, I'm going to be here. So by, in fast forward in four years, I had, um, of the 200 kids in uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade band, or fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade at the Catholic school, I had about 180 in band. So I went from six to 180 in a few years. And it was, we played a lot of kickball, you know, I'll be honest. I think that's why most of them were in middle school band there. Um, but I tried to make it fun. I tried to make it something they wanted to be a part of. And I think when I did interview for that first tenure track position, and they ask, well, tell us about your middle school band. I was able to describe that scenario instead of being, saying, well, I, there were six people when I came there and eight when I left. Um, so I think it's, it's easy to think, well, I'll just, I'll just do this until this. And I think it's important that everything you do, um, you know, this gets a little philosophical, but I think everything you do, I think you, you treat it uh, it, it's with importance and, and it, it matters. It matters to to you. It matters to everyone involved. You know, so I, I learned a lot from that. So, yeah. So, um, I don't know, I think that maybe ties in a little bit, but just that was my experience pre that first full time higher education job. So, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Anybody else on all the hats you have to wear, how you might juggle that? I was, uh, I was going to be a school teacher, and I got a degree in music ed because I loved it. I've never, I've never not valued that degree, and I use what I learned there all the time. But there's a story about, there's a famous tubist named Tommy Johnson, and he was a studio tubist, and he, t he was a music ed major. so. He ended up to be the biggest studio player in the history of the business. And he made, I can't even think of how much money he made. He played everything that came out. And he got a call, he was just getting started, and he was in his high school band, he needed a sub. And the sub didn't show up on time. He had this big recording session. He didn't know what it was, it was a big session. And he waited and waited, and finally the sub showed up. And he got his car and he tore out of there and he went to the session and he got there and he opened the music because he wanted to look at it. And there was all this low stuff like, da 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 da. And, and you know, he's <laughs> looking at this. And then he says, what, what the hell is this? And he looks, he says, this is called Jaws. I've never heard of this. And the conductor, this new guy named Johnny Williams, was kind of <laughs> conducting. And he ended up playing that part. And it's a, le listen to the music, it's a legendary thing. And he continued on his career in that way. He never wanted to lose his junior high school band. He was 50 years old. He was still going to the junior high and teaching every day because he just loved it. He, he valued wearing those different hats. He was afraid if he got too specialized that he may lose his completeness or something. I don't know, but he kept doing it. I always use that as a, as a source of inspiration because uh, we all have, you know, we get to every job and there's just different requirements. The roles we play are so different. I, I agree with Brad. I think we just need to embrace them and really, you know, go for what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. For, I think variety is a gift, it's not a hindrance. <laughs> and, um, you know, I know for me, currently in the, the teaching I do at our school, you know, um, I teach some of the trombone majors, and then and then uh, the the others are fortunate enough to study with Larry. But I also teach all the euphonium majors and the jazz trombone majors, and then I'm um, chair of our winds brass percussion department. Um, co get to co-direct our trombone choir, and then I I'm the director of a program we call Eastman to Go, which is where we train chamber groups to go out and play in the community, and whether that, everything from elementary schools and other scholastic venues to uh, soup kitchens, homeless shelters, you know, adult care facilities, hospitals, whatever. And so, to me, mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I love about doing all those different things is is there's a constant new sense of engagement with all of those things. Plus. I really get to know students from across the school. They're not just the, the trombone players or euphonium players or jazz majors, but it's it's a really nice cross-section. And so, you know, that 
I think that's a real gift, actually. And it's, you know, it means you have to be organized and all that stuff. Like, we all have to be with everything, all have to be with everything we do. But it's, it, you know, it's nice. And I, I have a, a, you know, a, a particular colleague at school who who will, you know, when he gets a little upset about something, he'll say, like, you know, your students fill in the blank. You know, and, it's, and I have to remind them, you know, actually, they're our students. They're not my students. They're... <laughs> our students you know so it does take a village and if you have a lot of different hats then you get to check in on a lot of different villages which is pretty cool so anyway just something to think about yeah no that's all great yeah great wisdom i feel like great stories so shifting a little bit to more specific um working with students what strategies or kind of tools do you use with probably what you know, the broad spectrum of personalities or motivation in your students that, that you teach. You know, sometimes, especially maybe at the college level, um, you might have some that are not as motivated as others. Maybe somebody's, oh, I'm not going to go on to be a performer, so, you know, I'll just kind of do, you know, do what I need to do or do what I think is necessary. So how do you sort of, um, I don't want to say deal with those, per deal with those students, but um, how do you motivate them? How do you keep them interested in sort of um, wanting to still strive to improve and learn? Anybody? It's a big question, too. They're all kind of big, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it's rare that I'll teach college students. I primarily work with high school students. So that's where I feel like it's a double-edged sword. You have the students and their desires. And for those of you that are out teaching, lots of middle and high school students, it seems like every year students have more and more things on their plate. They're in more activities. They have karate, they have basketball, they have their AP scholar work, and then they come to you for trombone or music lessons. And that's where it's a question of what does the student want to do? That's where building a relationship with them is so important. Mm -hmm. And then also, the other side of it is that the standard is the standard, and it keeps getting higher and higher each year. So that's where I like to set out very clear goals with a student. If a student wants to go to college and they want to get a trombone scholarship, there's a certain standard of playing that has to be achieved. They have to play a Bordoni very, very well. They have to know all their major and minor scales two octaves. They have to have a great sound. They need to know what a great trombone player sounds like. So all those goals have to be met while still weaving into the other things, their other obligations that they have in their life. And also that's where building a relationship with their parents can be super important, making them understand these are our goals that we set and this is what we're building towards. We want them to get into Eastman or University of Kentucky or wherever else. And so what is it going to take for them to do that? So that's where I like to make sure that I do both of those things. And the students that I have that aren't as motivated, that's where I know they're probably not going to practice that much during a certain week. They're going to come to me, and they might not have brought the horn out since the last lesson. That's where I can take them and make sure they meet those goals by making it happen in the lesson. It's more work for me, but it still makes sure the goal is met. And so everyone is successful in that way. Anybody else? You taught Jesus, right? <laughs> yes. So I get a student that comes your way, and his fundamentals are so solid. They're so, like, bulletproof solid. He gets to me, I don't have to do any of that stuff. And so many times these students come to us, and they don't have fundamentals like that. They, they have been taught improperly, and, and it's tragic because they want to really progress in their instruments. And it's not just, oh, I want to be an orchestra player. They may want to be a teacher and play in a community band, but it's like you said, the standards are getting so much higher. So playing a community band, you got to have a certain level. And um, some of these players have problems that they have, um, they have built up that just, you know, it's going to be very difficult to counteract their bad training. So I should appreciate what you did with him. I, I'm not kidding. It was it was just solid, and that's. I think I'd like to. I hope we could get more students like that where the training in high school is so good. You know, and that's also where I think like you know someone that teaches younger people, and a lot of us, those of you that might still be in school, or even those of you that work with younger people, like. 
I always looked at it as a, a way to sharpen myself. If I'm working on my student with long tones, or working on getting a really good lip slur, I have to be able to perform that also. And that gives me an opportunity to get my practice in while I'm still teaching them. And it was the same thing talking about wearing different hats that I was able to do with other instruments. I taught at a yeshiva school on Long Island where I taught brass and piano. I had exactly one brass student, and when I left the job, I had zero brass students. And I had 25 piano students every week. Hmm. Working with that, you would think, you would think, oh, you know, I'm not really getting anything out of that. It was an excellent opportunity to work on pitch, work on rhythm. Even though I'm not a great piano player like Dr. Thickpin is, I am competent enough to where I use that to help enhance my trombone playing. So that's where you can turn that inward, anything that you're doing, whether you're working with a beginning band, whether you're working with, say, a tuba student or a trumpet student, maybe even a bassoon student, and you can help make yourself better at the same time. And that's how I really looked at teaching some of my private students and it helped enhance them as well. Yeah, that's sort of along the lines of taking advantage of the opportunities that you're given. And when you're making a living freelancing, that's pretty much what you're doing, right? You've got to make a living. So teaching piano, okay, how can I make this useful and make it a good experience for the students, but also sharpen my skills that will help me when moving forward? Um, I had experienced freelancing as well for about five years before I got this job. So um, similar similar things to Staff Sergeant Berner. Um, does anybody else want to speak on kind of strategies with the students or it's okay believe me I got a whole arsenal over here <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so let's see um, something I just thought about when we were sitting here um, is in any job you know you can kind of get in a rut or have days when you wake up and it's like oh man I don't know if I can do it today so do you have any I don't know mantras or things that you things that help you when you really need kind of that motivation for yourself to be able to show up then for your students. Um, Cause I know when I was teaching a lot, it's like, Oh man, okay. I want them to have a good experience, but I don't know if I can, you know, bring out that, whew, you know, the bright, you know, smiley and da 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 for whatever might be happening in your daily life. So any kind of tips for that or what you might do to kind of help yourself get ready for the day if you're maybe not feeling it. Yeah, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll start. The um, my dad always used to tell me, and it, it it didn't really have a lot of resonance for me at the time he told me, but it sure does now. And I remember him him saying, you know, nobody else is in charge of your level of enthusiasm about what you do, except you. And um, that really has a lot of again resonance for for me. And so the question is, okay, well, how do you do that. So there are different. Obviously, as a as, as a teacher, there are different aspects of things that you can that you can you can latch onto with individual students. Whether it's musical, whether it's interpersonal, whether um, you know, with always with the hope of trying to connect with them in some way. And for me, I feel like if I can have some kind of connection with a with a student, um, and and again, that can take many different uh, forms. And fashions, um, then it's going to be a, an okay day, you know, and it's going to be a, a you know a good lesson. And so, and sometimes that means approaching students obviously in different ways. It's, it's I think the one the one thing that need, that I think is important to maintain and have a sense of unanimity about um, is a standard. So that's that's and then how you get to the sta that standard with each individual student to me at least and reasonable people can disagree about this but but to me it's approaching each student differently um, and and you know it, which may sound very obvious but at the same time I think probably a lot of us know people who are kind of method teachers and they have their way of going about doing it and if that works for you fantastic and if it doesn't you know you're kind of on the outside looking in so I think being open to um, to teaching in a variety of ways um, emphasizing different things and maybe even just just thinking about the way you connect with them interpersonally um, that's one way to like keep things fresh and and um, and just kind of rethink 
you know the what you want to do because it, it's you know it's it's a long you know somebody walks in for their first you know their first lesson as a freshman and you know the voice inside you is saying okay we got 120 hours to make this better how are we going to do that you know and it's hopefully it's a different path for for everybody yeah i i um to speak a little bit to that uh, a couple different aspects. One thing would be, um, I, I still feel like um, a little bit like that movie, Catch Me If You Can. You know, some days mm. I'm driving to work, I'm thinking, when is somebody going to figure out what I really do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. You know, I get to go in and talk about trombone and play trombone, and it's it's uh, wow. I feel incredibly lucky. Um, that being said, there are a couple thing, a couple words that I've heard several times: community, a relationship, you know, interpersonal um, type things. And I think that's one thing that I think that really rings true. And it's you know, sitting here with with on this panel and, and just hearing the one of the the iconic Eastman Trombone Choir, and we're all blown away. There was one thing that stuck out to me, Larry. His introduction of his of his after they did Takata and Fugue was he talked about how they were some of the nicest people that he's around. He didn't talk about, wow, you should hear her play a high F and you should hear him play a double pedal B flat. Now, that's the one thing that he said after that piece was how he enjoyed those incredible people. And, and, and Mark, similarly, at the end when he introduced the piece by a former student, yeah. Jack, talking about who he was, not as a trombonist, but as a person. And I think that's something that um, I think if you hold to that, to that community and building that community, because that community is the other reason, in, in my opinion, is why that group sounds the way it sounds, is there's a community aspect to that. And and a um, and that's something that's that's huge. I think it's and that's something that's hard to really put into words and to really put into any type of um, data, you know, to study. But it's really the type of thing that is is bringing a group to an event like this together. Yeah. I know we we got a cabin two nights ago. Maybe it was a good idea. I don't know. I guess we'll see. But it was, it was. We built some community when the grill didn't work, and we built a fire and had to take the grate off the grill that didn't work and put it on top of the coals and make the burgers outside when it was 25 degrees. You know, there's something that's that we all took from that adversity training. Adversity yeah. training. <laughs> But no, that that stuck with me today. You know, when Larry, when Larry got, when you know, again, the Takata and Fugue. I mean, my goodness, it was amazing. And when he introduced that piece, the thing that he said, he talked about those people, those great people, on stage with him. So that I think that's that kind of sums it up for me. You know, that's cool. so. That's cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, kind of the importance of remembering, obviously, that we're all people, right? Yeah. And that comes first. I mean, of course, we all want to study trombone and get better, but we also have to sort of take care of each other and be a community, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's, I love that. Team building, too, right? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have to take the form of, okay, studio, every Thursday night we go bowling. Right. You know, it doesn't right. have to be no. that. In fact, you know, I, w I would say... But there's there's definitely a way that you get a, get that across that hey we're all in this together, we're all learning, you know we're all all trying to you know do our best to you know be the best versions of ourselves that we can be and you know I, I think just getting that that across and and really valuing a sense of curiosity, yes. you know yeah is really in fact somebody uh, asked um, uh, asked uh, actually Larry and I were were. Had the good fortune to be interviewed for a for a uh, online thing that that Mike Davis does his his great hip bone interviews and 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 you know he said asked that question which was you know what are the things that you look for in a student and boy for me it's a sense of curiosity you know and and that's that's really important I mean that's really you know that's what really if someone is curious and usually curious students come from curious teachers 
And so if you can portray that, you know, to, you know, to your students and, well, I want to know more about that. Or, you know, I don't really, I don't really know what Stravinsky was thinking about when you, let's, let's go to the Google machine and figure, figure, <laughs> figure this out together. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's, that's, you know, that's great. You know. Oh, great. Um, another thing I thought of while y'all were talking about, well, everything so far, is I know I've heard stories from teachers um, and, you know, seen things uh, in school. Let's say, uh, you know, a student shows up for a lesson. Maybe they've had a rough night or a rough week, and long story short, they're not prepared, right? They're not to the level that they want it, and they probably know they're very well not to the level that you might want them to be at for that lesson. So how do you how do you approach that? You know, I've heard stories of some teachers that say, okay, well, go practice. You know, see you next week, that type of thing, um, which I can understand to some point, um, depending on, you know, the situation. But I guess I'm just curious kind of how y'all might handle that or how you've handled it in the past that you've seen be successful. Students are so different. I, we've all yeah. said that, but they're so different. And... Every student requires such a, a unique perspective on how you're going to approach them. And you need to get to know them so you know how they're going to react in different situations. And there's a student, you know, that comes in and says he didn't practice. And there, there's never any malice behind it. They never mean anything. It's just they get so wound up in other things. So, okay, maybe they just didn't have the time this week. They had a midterm and they had this and that maybe there's something underlying that really has them upset. And most of the time, just by sitting and talking casually for a few minutes, they will tell you what that is. And then you pursue it from there. And uh, they're very intellectually complex students. These students we have at Eastman, they're so smart. And they're they're very complex. So you have to really understand where they're coming from. So when a student comes in and is not prepared, most of the time it's not just, I just didn't want to practice, right. you know? So uh, I'm always really tuned into that. And I've had the most amazing experiences with this. I mean, some things have come out I would have <laughs> never expected. But you deal with it, you work with it. You maybe you direct them towards people that can help them, professionals, or maybe you offer some opinions, and usually we work through it. Um, but you looked up there at the Eastman Trombone Choir, each one of those kids is so amazingly different. And, um, and yet they're friends, and they, they interact so well with each other. So I notice when they get to Eastman, too, there's a vibe, there's a culture at Eastman that just kind of promotes that sense of community. And some of the students come in, they're a little they're a little suspicious and they're not quite ready to, to kind of buy in. By the end of the first semester, they're all part of it. You know, they're all part of the community. So it's nice to see. You know, it's very gratifying to do. Oh, yeah. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? Well, on that, you know, to build even more off of that, as a private educator, you know, you can go from middle school up through the collegiate level where does a student spend more one-on-one -on -one time with someone apart from their parents and with you? Yeah, you're here. You have such a great opportunity. You should be, you know, not a friend, but definitely a mentor. You should, you're one part psychiatrist, one part mentor, one part coach. And it's such an amazing feeling when you have someone that's successful. But some of my most meaningful lessons, individual lessons, were with students that weren't necessarily the best players. There were people that were going through a really tough time and being able to have that relationship with them to help them through a hard time, through something they might not be able to talk to their family about, through something that they're really struggling with in their personal life or in their school life. That's what our job in part is because you know, they're spending 120 hours individually with them. They're not gonna spend that much time with anybody else in their college time, at least not one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And the same thing when you're teaching someone at the middle school through the high school level, you're with them as they grow up. They're going to change completely as a human being. And that's why building a relationship like that is so important, taking the time. Yeah, if a student comes in and they're not playing very well, well, that's why they're paying me for the lesson. I'm going to work with them on 
what they didn't practice that week. They're paying me for my time. But I also owe it to them to give my best back to them, to help them not only with the music, but with whatever else is happening. Oh, you have an AP psych test. You know, you had cross-country practice. Oh, you had to go to golf camp for a week. It's okay. Come on back. We'll get you ready for an old walk-in, and, you know, we'll work on all this stuff. That's our job as teachers, to meet them where they are. Yeah. I would love to have the expectation that they know everything, but they're mm-hmm. probably not going to. And I shudder to think of what my private teacher through middle and high school would say if he was in the back here. Like, <laughs> oh, he didn't have it together. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, okay, changing a little bit to a different question. What advice <coughs> do you either wish you'd gotten sort of at the start of your teaching career or teaching experience and or what's the best advice you did receive so maybe if somebody gave you advice that stuck with you or maybe thinking back what do you sort of almost wish somebody had I don't want to say warned you about but best advice you know something on that topic study conducting when you're in college (laughs) study conducting you're here (laughs) no that is great advice anybody else can you Play more piano. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, that yeah. saved, that kept me alive when I was a freelancer in New York. I mean, it's great when you have these big marquee events, but there's a lot of small children with parents that really want them to learn how to play piano. Mm-hmm. Just knowing how to play C major can really help you in so many ways. If you stay one lesson ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's great advice. Anybody else? I would also say, think about what worked for you. Because if you're at the level to where you're teaching, you're probably pretty decent as a player. Think about what helped you, what impacted you, and then do that back for your students. That's what I try to do. Yeah. Just yeah. another thought. Yeah, I, I think generally um, there, there are, you know, this isn't, I think 100% the case, but I think largely we teach the way we were taught. Right. Unless we have the, you know, the discernment of real really good self-examination and we can we can kind of pick through the things and really think about okay, what, you know, what really, you know, what did I really learn? you know, from, you know, this particular teacher, what aspects of music or technique or whatever did I learn from this student or from from this teacher, and then, and then saying, wow, that was really good, but I wish that blank had happened. I think, I think it's easy to just teach the way you were taught, and that's fine, but I think going one or three levels lower than that and really examining you know how how that affected you, and how you can maybe change that for the better. Um, you know, is 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 an important aspect of of things. And I, and I you know, I think uh, this is always one of my favorite quotes about teaching. That um, I shared this with somebody yesterday. That that eighty percent of what we remember about our teachers is who they were as people. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like you know there may be like oh I remember you know so and so really helped me relax my bow arm or so and so you know gave me this incredible um, insight into the music of Brahms or this person man really helped me with my high range or you know whatever and those are that's all, that's all great but largely what we remember is the way our teachers interacted with us and you know did they respect us did they did they were they kind to us and and remember being kind doesn't mean you're a softy right and that you like just let everything go right there's a difference there's and i think we all need to have those those limits imposed on us all of us from time to time and and as as long as it's done in a in a kind way i think you know that's absolutely you know fine that's the way as it should be but um yeah i think uh i think just remembering that that 80 percent rule is very you know it's very helpful for me right no that's great that's great advice um, does anybody have any questions for our panel here yes i'm going to try to get to you so you can everybody can hear it i know yes oh first of all thank you very much for this panel this is so amazing like a lot of wisdom uh i want to talk a little bit about trauma 
Like I know that teachers mean well when they te teach us. However, uh, there might be traumas that can be created uh, through the education that they got to us. And then like those traumas are very uh, tied to what it is hesitation. Like Verinka Rice is doing a great job about how trauma can even affect the way we play physically. So with that being said, how do you manage yourselves as teachers in the like managing those traumas that can happen that that had happened to yourself? So like we avoid to pass those traumas to the students. You, you have to kind of decide if uh, the trauma is something you want to help or you want to teach them to uh, absorb and and kind of learn how to deal with their themselves so I I teach what for me I mean I teach with this understanding I look at them 50 years from now are they still going to be good players and what can I do to teach them <clears throat> ways to be healthy that they can continue to do that emotionally I hope we all teach our kids at Eastman to deal with traumas. I mean, you got, I just had a kid uh, just in the last three weeks, I've had two, three close deaths of people to them. And you have to give them a chance to express themselves. You can't avoid that with them. You can't say, you know, this isn't going to happen. It's just going to happen. So your, I think your question is two part. Number one, the traumas of playing and I'm always thinking long term. And the other part is the traumas they experience that are not in playing. And you have to just, you have to help them deal through it. Uh, a, a, one of my students, his grandfather died. Another one had an, a, a, an aunt and a cousin, her daughter, both died like within a month or something. So there, there's a lot of loss they experience. For some of them, it's the first time. You just, you have to kind of be flexible with that. But from the physical trauma, I'm always thinking for them, how is this gonna is this gonna last? You know, how are they gonna feel about this kind of work in 50 years? And if it doesn't seem like it's something that's gonna last, I'll change the way they do it so that it's more mainstream and it does last. Does that answer your question? Or? Anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? Hello. Um, I feel like a lot of the time, especially with younger students, they're looking extremely far down the line. Like I, I have a personal student that I teach and he came in for his first lesson and he said, I want to be just like J.J. Johnson. I want to be one of the best known names in the trombone world. How can you get those students grounded to work on their fundamentals? And how can you convince them that if you want to get to that level, we need to start here. Well, that's where, with the students that I work with, it's really important that, yes, we've got a long-term goal. But also, I, I like it. It's a quote that I have attributed to Frank Crisofoli, and I'm not sure it was actually him that said it or not, but by the inch, life's a cinch. By the yard, life is really hard. <laughs> if you're looking at J.J. Johnson as a ninth grader, I mean, life's going to be really rough for a really, really long time. <laughs> so that's where I look at it as we have this goal that's 20 years away. Where can we be and set goals each year, even every three months? So I was, okay, I want you to transcribe one of his solos. Then I want you to memorize it. Then I want you to play it in eight different keys. That should take a year. So with that, we've got our goal. We're going to play one of his pieces. We're going to play it. We're going to write it out. We're going to play through it. We're going to do everything else. And then once you play through it, you realize, man, I've got all these other problems that are happening because I don't sound like JJ. I don't have the range. I don't have the flexibility. That's great. This is the Arbenz book. We're going to work on all of that stuff. <laughs> or this is Schlossberg, or insert your favorite book here. It's having the long-term goal, where you want to be the destination, but also having obtainable little bites along the way. But I like to say, especially to my younger students, like I taught a fourth grader this morning who's about that tall, and I'm teaching him trumpet. 
and he wants to play. He heard Wynton Marcells play Carnival Venice. He just loves Carnival Venice. It's going to be a rough couple of years. But <laughs> with that, with that, he's working on it. He's working on his fundamentals. He comes in. He's like, he's got his Arbin book that's you know the size of him, and he's working on these things. And I'm like, that's great. This is how it starts. Let's work now on just playing a C. Let's make it be just as pure as Winton C having obtainable goals along the way. And I, what I told him this morning, you have to eat a pizza the size of this table, you're probably not gonna eat it all in one sitting, or you're gonna throw up a lot. Take a bite. That's what you're doing each day when you practice. So as an educator, to summarize, as an educator, I make obtainable goals, because if it's not something they can run into and succeed at, they're gonna trip and fall, they're gonna get discouraged, they're gonna get mad, and that's when they start to do weird things. They start to press, they start to have hitches in their playing. I see more and more students in high school with problems like Valsalva, with uh, issues chop-wise, because they're giving themselves too much trauma, they're trying too hard, because they care. And that's where you have to know your student and set obtainable goals. So I would suggest things like that, small little bites. One thing I do, I used to do it with a, it was a, a Word document, but now I just simply, it's, a, it's an email every semester. So it's a, a couple of my students here will, will recognize this, but it's always a, the email is spring 2023 and long-term goals. So acknowledge those long-term goals. It's what do you want to do? Where do you want to live? Um, you know, those types of things. And then next is a short-term goal. And we list those short-term goals that will influence the long-term goals. And so that way, yeah, I like to acknowledge those long-term goals. It could, could be, you know, sound like J.J. Johnson. Um, and then like, like you're saying, then you've got to work back from there and put those in writing and reference that email. Like I said, it used to be a Word document, but now it's just a little bit easier with an email throughout the semester. So. And that doesn't change necessarily once, you know, the student's out of your hands. Once they get to Eastman and they're with Larry and Mark or Kentucky with Brad or once they're in the Army band like I am, I still have goals that I'm moving towards. Some of them are reaching for the moon. Like, I want to play in the New York Philharmonic. Will it happen? We'll see. But I still have that goal of I want to keep getting better. I want to make goals happen. That's a long-term goal. I also have the short-term goal of, well, I'd really like to buy a house. And if you know the property taxes around here, you know it's a little harder than it should be. But having those goals in many facets of life really, really help. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Anybody else? Anybody? Oh, yep. Yes. How do you deal with motivating the student with it having in mind the final outcome of the, 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 the competition that we deal with to becoming you know, a full-time player, professional with a position is very difficult. And we, we must motivate our students for that. But how do, we, how do you motivate them knowing that it's going to be very hard with few positions for all these applicants? Actually, I'll, I'll start the, the bidding on this one. The, uh, um, my son is soon to be 25. He's a professional actor. And, he, and he's, I'm very proud of him. We all have kids and, and, and you know, uh, other people in our lives that we're very proud of. And I'm, I'm no different with him. And, um, boy, you, we think we have it hard as musicians. Man, that world, that's really difficult. It's it's a it is a grind, and there are a lot of people that are involved in it, and um, so you know one of one of the things that he and I have talked about is you know when you have to go do an audition, you know it, it isn't like just oh man I know that there are going to be hundreds of people that are interested in being on this HBO series or whatever. It's like no when you go into when you go into audition you got a fifty fifty chance. It's not one out of. 340 it's like you got a 50 50 chance of either doing doing your you know doing your your best to being considered or maybe not and if and if you don't well you know you then you 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 know you set the pins up in the next alley and you try you try again but i think if you if you get if we get out over our skis too much with the daunting sensibility that comes along with the profession that we're involved that we're involved with um 
boy, it, it can be tough to get out of bed in the morning, you know. So I, I think the, the most important thing is to help th th find a way with students to, like, make sure that they know that there's that, that very pragmatic side of things, but it's about trying to help them to enjoy the journey along the way. Because that the journey along the way is when they'll learn other things that, like, oh, yeah, I thought all I wanted to do was play in a symphony orchestra, but, you know, I actually really like teaching or men. Arts management really is interesting to me because because you, as their private teacher, have have maybe fostered a sense of uh, of being very inclusive about other goals that that they might have, or maybe things you notice about them that maybe you can kind of like, hey, have you ever considered you know X, Y, or Z? You know, in addition to the great playing you're doing, you know, this is maybe something something else to consider. So you're right; it is it's daunting and it is very competitive, but it's um. You know, you, it's it's if if the if you can if you can be not only not only inspired and and moved by the goals, but also kind of moved and inspired by the process, then there's a lot more wiggle room for success, whatever mm -hmm. success means. You know. Do you want to add something? I could add maybe? just one thing to that. That's absolutely right. Everything that Mark said, but I also try to keep my students as versatile as I can. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you get students and you kind of get a sense of who they are. Hey, have you thought about doubling on bass trombone? Let's put a bass trombone piece on your recital. Or you should play some alto. How about the baritone? What about jazz? Uh, have you been in the jazz band? You should get in the jazz band. Yeah. How do you make these kids, then you get these kids that are just really smart, you say, why don't you kind of check out the arts leadership program here? You can get a, a, a certificate as part of your degree that's arts leadership or teaching. Maybe you should take this music ed class. We try to keep them so versatile, like where they have so many options. So it's just like Mark said, they don't have to just have that one goal. But all of a sudden, it opens up a whole world to them. And then they become creative and maybe discover ways that are going to make them happy that you didn't even think of. So that's what yeah. we try to do at Eastman. I, you know, so I'm sure you do too. Yeah, the same thing. Keep them versatile. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's really great advice. Uh, I mean, it's it's really valuable, I feel like, wisdom. <laughs> um, and I was just thinking, and I add two things. I think, and these are pretty general, but persistence and patience, mm. right? No matter what direction their career might go. Um, I had a similar experience in my undergrad. I studied with Brad Edwards, who I'm sure you've all heard of or used his books. And I was very fortunate to uh, study with him in my undergrad. And he was very supportive in that way of, oh, have you done this? Oh, maybe you should try this. And kind of, you know, uh, letting me realize what my options were. I wanted to be a band director. I love teaching. I still do. But he encouraged me, oh, you want to audition for grad school? Sure. Well, let's do it. And then I ended up getting into grad school um, and pursuing that and then pursuing performance, ultimately. Um, so just persistence and patience in whatever outlet or direction they seem to go, I think, is very just very good to remember. So we are just out of time. I wish we could just keep chatting. But the Capitol Bones are about to start um, across the way. And we all know how fabulous they are. So can we please give everyone a round of applause? Thank you so much. Nicely done, Jens. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you as always. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Ye